Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Cole, sleep medicine specialist and bona fide chronic insomniac. Welcome to the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast. Remember, knowledge is empowerment, and if applied correctly, it can help you biohack your way to a better night of sleep, just like I did. If this resonates with you, please follow me on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the season finale of the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast. And what better way to end this first season than bringing back my first guest, Dr. Val Cacho. Welcome, girlfriend. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole, Allison, my sleep buddy. (laughs) Yeah. So I always call you, like, for some reason, I've just decided I'm going to call you Dr. Val. I think it's because that's your kind of handle. Like when you kind of talk about yourself, you do that. Is there anything new and exciting going on with Sleepphoria? Because sleepphoria.com, like you have been, I'm getting newsletters. I've seen you on a number of podcasts. You've been doing a number of webinars. Like things are moving for you. Can you talk a little bit more about what's new and exciting? Yeah. So I'm trying to find my stride. And what does that mean? What I like doing most. And I think what I like doing most is videos. So uh, definitely I do my mini webinars twice a month and I'm working on a new series called Sleep Basics and they're going to be five minutes or less just information about sleep health, sleep science for all the ladies out there. So that's going to be in my YouTube, which is Sleephoria. So cool. Very cool. And you can always get an appointment with Dr. Val as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to her if you want some one-on-one kind of coaching and instruction. Yeah. So for me, Everything is going well. I can't even believe I got through a first season. I mean, I was so nervous. You know, the first episode, I was like, I'm just, I want to yak. I can't believe I'm even doing this. And now I'm like, hey, what's up? I get to talk to Val again, and I love it. And this is your wheelhouse. So you really have focused your career on really getting to know the underserved. And the underserved, I mean women, right? We are underrepresented in studies our sleep is underrepresented. The symptoms we present with are not necessarily the same as men. And we go through this whole thing. Like, yes, we can have babies, but we also go through the whole thing where we stop being able to do that and we hit the perimenopausal age, our midlife. So I really wanted to talk about sleep and perimenopause because you and I both know universally millions of women suffer from this and suffer from sleep disruption. I didn't realize in the statistics that it's like 50% of women, depending on where you define the age group you are in, will have sleep disruption, right, from in the perimenopausal area. So when we talk about perimenopause, for most of the ladies, you may think you know what it is, but there may be a very specific definition. Can you kind of elaborate on how you see it? What's the sort of scientific, I guess, definition of perimenopause for the audience? Great question. So perimenopause, right? Peri means in and around, but really we use the word perimenopause to define you're having symptoms for menopause, which are typically hot flashes, night sweats, mood instability, decreased libido, anxiety, depression, insomnia, dry skin, bone pain. You know, the, the list can go on and on and on. And you're still having your periods. Maybe it's not every month. It's starting to spurt a little bit. Maybe you're having it. You don't have it for a couple months and then you have it again. So the average age of perimenopause in the U.S. is actually 47. And what's tricky about it, just like sleep medicine, is that, you know, in medical school, doctors aren't trained about perimenopause. You know, we do hear about menopause. It's maybe an hour lecture in your OB-GYN rotation. But a lot of what we get for women's health in medical school is how to support a woman who has a baby, you know, the whole pregnancy. And, you know, it makes sense because it's a happy time. But as we get older, and I think this is just our society, women start to be forgotten. Definitely, they're underrepresented. There's a lot of gender bias in medicine, and aging is just not valued. And so that's such an unfortunate thing. And it's really one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on women in midlife is because when I was working in a hospital system, I would see so many women coming through just for poor sleep. And the main reason they were coming in is just to try to see if they had sleep apnea or the doctors didn't know what to do. And maybe they were already on a sleeping pill and they were still not sleeping. 
And so there's just more and more reasons to want to help women because A, we're both women and maybe it's a sort of a, I want to be able to help myself when I get a little bit older and go through some of these symptoms. But there's so many people who are sort of suffering in silence. And you said the statistic, right? About 50%. So 40 to 60% of women in and around perimenopause and menopause have difficulty sleeping. And I feel like that sucks. But you know, that is way, way, way too high. Yeah. And that's just not right. I mean, I already have trouble sleeping and I have not hit perimenopause. At least I don't think so. Part of my uterus was removed after my second baby. So mm. I don't have some of the usual sort of signals. I feel like it's just mm. me wanting to murder my husband once a month. I'm like, that seems to be still regular. So <laughs> that and I clean my okay, house. Yeah, that's the baseline. <laughs> I'm obsessively cleaning mm. and I really got to regulate my mood because I definitely mm. see a change there. But I think about it and, and I cringe going, oh my goodness, I already have worked so hard to get my sleep back on track and I'm in a good place right now. And I'm like, great. So right. I can just look forward to that potentially going in the toilet in a few years. Great. Potentially be getting, be getting <laughs> augmented, right? I feel like perimenopause, menopause is when, you know, the microscope is sort of, you know, put down on your whole life and things that you thought the way they were maybe aren't so much or things are augmented. So we'll see, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, there's a lot of things I'm sure we'll go into and support as you go through this. And a lot of it is education. And when you think about it too, if we think back to circa 1900, the average life expectancy for a woman was pretty much like you were just starting to hit perimenopause and then you were no longer on this earth. We just live a lot longer too. So with the advances in both medicine, as well as our general life expectancy, male and female, it's amazing that we're at a point where we're still sitting here scratching our heads a little bit because I feel like technology advanced for certain areas, but not so much for the knowledge of perimenopause, as you mentioned. So you had mentioned this actually in a prior podcast, Michelle Lamoureux. Mm -hmm. Did I say her last name correctly? Yeah, I think that's right. It's French. Yeah. Okay. So you had mentioned specifically just talking a little bit about sleep architecture, mm -hmm. and we've talked about that some on this podcast. So just for anybody listening, generally speaking, when we talk about sleep architecture, we're referring to the stages of sleep that you go into. And typically we have a sleep cycle that's around 90 minutes-ish or so. You can have some variability to that, but I mean, an hour and a half to two hours-ish. And we have our non-rapid eye movement sleep. So we have a lighter stage one, then we have stage two, then we have our deep or slow wave sleep, which is stage three. Then we have our rapid eye movement sleep, and that sort of is the tail end of a, a sleep cycle. And then we do that all over again and all over again and all over again, and then we're up for the day. Now, one of the things we do know about aging is that the slow wave sleep decreases over time. Is that just a function of age? Is that something that is a natural phenomenon and something that we should not be messing with to increase it? I don't know what the right answer is for that, but are there any other characteristics? I just couldn't find any data on this and maybe you know it. Is there anything else in terms of sleep architecture that is unique to women or do they sort of still, the sleep architecture sort of remains the same? It's more of these other symptoms out of curiosity. I just want to say women are complex. So I do think it's a, a mixture of both. And I agree, you know, we don't have all the answers to explain it. What I understand it, it's age related changes that are leading to decreased slow wave sleep, decreased REM sleep. But if you think about what's happening from a physiologic standpoint, from a physical standpoint, as we get older, we develop high blood pressure, we develop diabetes, we have more arthritis. And guess what? Those things can wake us up. If you have a lot of nocturia, you're waking up to urinate. If you can't stay on your back for too long, you're going to shift to your side. You're going to wake up and be light stage before you go back into the deeper stages. You're going to be on medications that can disrupt your sleep and, you know, you suppress REM. So there's definitely reasons from that. From a hormonal standpoint, is there something unique to women? I'd say definitely, especially if you're having acute fluctuation. So it's really interesting when they take a look at some of the studies for women who've gone through you know, surgical menopause. So when you've actually removed the ovaries, both of the ovaries, women have higher rates of sleep disruption. So it's that really acute onset where your hormones are really fluctuating abruptly. And we talk about 
hormones, there's so many hormones, hormones are just messengers. But for, you know, the sake of this conversation, we're talking about estrogen and progesterone, right? So progesterone progestation, it's also known as a relaxation hormone. So when we have lower levels of that, it can disrupt our sleep, lead to some insomnia. And then estrogen, you know, those abrupt changes in estrogen can also lead to the hot flashes, those pesky hot flashes, which can really disrupt your sleep. So I say, you know, those are probably some of the reasons that can affect women in midlife and older. But also, we don't talk about this a lot. And some of the research shows that melatonin starts to decline. And this is not unique for women, but around the age of 55 to 60. And melatonin, there's so much information out there. And I'm glad that people are talking about it. I mean, I like to say it's sold like candy or like gum. And it really shouldn't be because it's a natural hormone. But what happens for some of the research that I've seen in women is that a little bit of melatonin during menopause can actually help improve the quality of your sleep if you are having disruptions in your sleep. It may have some anxiolytic type effects. It may be a little bit calming. But from also a physiologic standpoint, melatonin may help improve your body's temperature. And so when you're sleeping, right, your core body temperature decreases. And if you have a hot flash, right, that'll wake you up. So if you have, I guess, a more regulated, a more controlled temperature thermostat, maybe those awakenings won't be so abrupt or it won't be so discomforting. And then some of the research shows in later menopause, all right, there's perimenopause when you're still having your periods, you're having symptoms, menopause when it's gone a year without having your period, and then postmenopause when you don't have your periods anymore, you don't have any symptoms. Some of the research shows in postmenopause, we have women have a lower set thermostat. And the way I think about it is it's just they're more chill, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe if they're doing, having some hot flashes, you know, their thermometer is set lower. It doesn't bother them as much. So those may be some hormone or women-related, gender-related changes that can impact someone's sleep architecture. Great points. I wanted to try to add to that. I mean, Val, you're really the expert in this, but when I was researching about things like why an antidepressant like uh, an SSRI mm. would help someone with menopausal symptoms, and then what I learned was that estrogen withdrawal, that as you mentioned, the change in the, the decrease in progesterone, the decrease in estrogen, actually leads to a decline in some really significant neurotransmitters. We have norepinephrine and we have serotonin, which we know is so good for helping us actually not only our mood, but also helping us with our sleep. And so the thought was that these neurotransmitters do affect how the hypothalamus functions and the hypothalamus is in the brain and actually regulates our temperature. So one of the ideas is that the reason it can help a bit with basomotor symptoms is it's actually kind of saying, okay, you're, you're losing your serotonin. We'll at least give you some extra and that might buffer some of the symptoms. Just in terms of some of the symptoms, you have definitely hit on a bunch of them, but I wanted to break it down a little bit more because we may be using terms that people are like vasomotor, right. <laughs> like what is that? And that's just basically a fancy way of explaining those hot flashes. So I at least try to give my version of what I understand to be a potential mechanism for hot flashes or these vasomotor symptoms. Anything else you want to add to that? I'm a big fan of looking at the emotional state. And the way I like to think about it is, you know, I'm sure you did a bunch of night calls back in your day when as a resident, I used to work as a nocturnist. And even if the hospital was quiet, you know, everyone was behaving, the ICU patients were all tucked in, and the ER was empty, I'd get a chance to sleep. But you would never know when that pager would go off. So there's that anticipation. And what we do know is, you know, women who have a little bit more anxiety, or maybe a little bit more stress, don't deal with the hot flashes as much, right? Because you start to think about it, and then that can create a little bit of an anxiety loop. And then when you have it, it's just augmented. So the thoughts that you have in and around your hot flash, the anticipation may even make it worse. That's sort of a completely different <laughs> definition from what the estrogen is doing. And it's just so interesting because... It talks about treatment. You know, I did a video recently, I don't know if you want to skip the treatment, where we took a look at gabapentin and there was a pretty small study. So sometimes we use gabapentin. It's a medication for neuropathy, but it can help with hot flashes as well. And they compared it to clinical hypnotherapy. And what's clinical hypnotherapy? It's really just a type of therapy that helps you relax. And it uses like different imagery. 
So one study that I reviewed actually showed for these women on gabapentin, the frequency of their hot flashes decreased maybe about 30%. But for the hot flash group, it was like 70%, 80%. So it's phenomenal because your mindset, right? You can train your brain how to stay chill. What are different ways to do so? Just imagine yourself in the snow. You're lying in the snow making snow angels or you're standing under a really cool waterfall. And as the cool water rushes over your head and down to your body, can you use that imagery to help reduce your temperature thermostat in your hypothalamus? And the answer is yes. So it's really, really cool. Mind-body practices. That is amazing. I had no idea that that data existed. And just from my clinical experience, a lot of the women I saw were actually quite healthy, but were really suffering from either, quote, vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes or just trouble sleeping in general, which the two often go hand in hand. And they are looking for ways that are not like, hey, give me a bunch of pharmacotherapy prescription sedative hypnotics for me to take to knock me out. A lot of them actually were like, how can I do this and just kind of get through it naturally? Because they are really health conscious, you know, groups of women. So this is a great, great point that you could actually literally just sort of retrain your brain, similar to what we tell people to do with insomnia, which corresponds to what we talk about, which is, you know, sometimes there are some reasons why a women can have difficulty with maintaining sleep. Some of it may be sleep disruption from the hot flashes, but you can also have just intrinsic insomnia. I think you did comment on progesterone as being the relaxation hormone and that decreasing. Is that one of the mechanisms of action or reasons for that to occur? Yeah, definitely. The thing about this is it's hard to do these type of studies, I think, in terms of doing the hormone studies and seeing how someone sleeps, because you can use subjective data, right, just by questionnaires, or you can do objective data. So when I give my talks about perimenopause, one of the research that I've seen is that the acute fluctuations are really what matters, right? So, you know, when you have your ovaries removed early on, when you're having difficulties with sleep, that abrupt change in the estrogen causes the FSH levels to rise. But objectively, you know, it wasn't the same study, but a different study actually put women in the lab and then measured their hormone levels. And guess what? That acute rise in the FSH wasn't associated with difficulty sleeping. Their sleep architecture was pretty much the same. And what does that show you is that, well, hormones definitely are complex, but they're not the whole story because the way you think about how you sleep is also really important. And, you know, just to quote another study, because we're really research driven here, is that, you know, women who are going through perimenopause and menopause who have difficulty sleeping, they actually did a CBTI program. So I know you spoke with Dr. Jen Martin, our mentor, about insomnia therapy. And women who learn about cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia versus the control group was just menopause education, actually slept better, and there was an improvement in their hot flash frequency as well. Just by going through an insomnia program, their hot flashes got better. Wow. Yeah, exactly. You know, I love that. A couple of really interesting things that we know also occur in the perimenopause more frequently is mm -hmm. our bread and butter, sleep apnea, right? So we can't forget about the medicine oh, yes. stuff. <laughs> we didn't even talk about sleep so apnea. talk to everybody about sleep apnea because you and I, this is where we are very much aligned that we see it so frequently and it is just, it's frustratingly ignored in women. It really, really is. It's amazing how many people are like, what? You think I have sleep apnea? And I'm like, I actually think we need to rule that out. And they almost look at me like I have a third head, like, oh, you just want to do a sleep study. I'm like, it's nothing about like me just wanting to do a study. Like, this is actually you not having trouble sleeping. This could be even though you're telling me you don't snore, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Well, yep. So you don't have to snore to have sleep apnea. If your partner's dead asleep, then they don't know, you know, use a tracker. There are so many different apps out there that can potentially monitor this. There was such an interesting study recently that I read that women didn't think they snored as loud as men. And that was really the premise for the study. So they put them in the lab with men and it was like, oh, yeah, women do snore 
and they snore just as loud as men. But it was like 20 to 30 percent of women just didn't even think that was a thing. They didn't even think that was possible because there's so much gender bias. It's so interesting. I was watching a show recently. I think it was like Never Have I Ever on Netflix. <laughs> and it was talking about how her uncle is coming to visit and she has to clean her room because he's going to set up his room for his sleep apnea kit. But, you know, women have sleep apnea, too. So it's not always portrayed equally. But yeah, women have a lot of sleep apnea. And as we go through perimenopause and menopause, we lose those hormones. Those hormones, the estrogen and progesterone, make everything stronger. You know, and I like to say gravity happens. Things start to get a little more saggy, even your upper airway. So when we talk about obstructive sleep apnea, it happens in the back of our throat, our posterior or our pharynx, where our tongue can fall back and close off. So, you know, prevalence rates of sleep apnea are definitely higher in men than in women up until women go through menopause. The rates double to triple. The problematic part is, right, just like in menopause, we're not really trained much in medical school. In sleep medicine, we're barely trained as well. So granted, if you do see a doctor with disrupted sleep and they give you a sleeping pill, you know, I'd say go see someone else. It's really easy to do a sleep study now. You can do it in the comfort of your own home. Yeah, women don't have to snore, don't even have to gasp or choke. I have a lot of women just have a hard time maintaining sleep, you know, that 2 to 3 a.m. wakening. I'm big on meditation. I'm, I'm big on mind-body practices and breathing. But one of my favorite things to say is all the meditation in the world isn't going to do anything if your tongue is falling back and choking you. So you need to do the sleep study, right? And they mostly say, okay, I mean, as long as I can do it at home, doc, that's fine. And it's just really something that you really want to rule out. You don't have to be on a CPAP machine. Sometimes that is the stumbling block. I'm a woman. I don't want to snore. But at the end of the day, when you get a great night of sleep, I almost feel like there's nothing that you can't do, right? When you have so much energy, when you're feeling better, when your brain is working more clear. I spoke to someone recently and why she prioritizes sleep is because she's more present with her kids. And that's super important to her. And she's a surgeon. And her reason for getting better sleep was because of her family. And I thought, wow, that's so cool. That is really cool. And just excellent, excellent advice. I'm going to share a story of how Dr. Cole got burned early, early in her sleep career, which is I had a patient who was body mass index slim, right? Slim, going through perimenopause. Malam potty one. What that means is I can have her open her mouth. I can see the tonsils back there. I can see the uvula. I can see all the tissue. So just eyeballing her did not see any obvious issues with an obstruction of her airway, denied all the symptoms. Her main complaint was difficulty sleeping. And I was talking to her and she really, you know, was sort of like, well, do I really need to do a sleep study? And I said, I would encourage it, but I didn't really push it. You know what I mean? I was just like, well, she's so thin. She has none of the risk factors. Eh. And I'm not kidding you. She came back and I was, I wanted to just curl up in a ball and die from embarrassment because lo and behold, she went to her dentist. And there's a lot of dentists that make oral appliances. And we'll get into that in another episode. Not all uh, sleep apnea needs to be treated with CPAP as, as Dr. Value mentioned. I'm not kidding you. She had some mild sleep apnea and she's like, well, now I have an oral appliance and I sleep much better. And I was like, I just mortified because I'm better than that. And I should have really convinced her to do the testing. And ever since then, I actually used that story. I'm like, Dr. Cole's been burned. I'm telling you right now, trust me on this. Let's get you screened. And there are folks that I you you worry because especially when they have difficulty sleeping, as, as happens in perimenopause, there's a lot of hesitancy about, oh, God, OK, now I have this issue with my breathing at night. And now I might have to get used to wearing this funky apparatus on my head. And how am I going to be able to do that? And then I'm going to wake up even more. And it's like this, you never know what you're going to get when you treat the sleep apnea, especially if they're having trouble sleeping. But I have definitely seen my fair share, and I'm sure you have too, of people who I really was like, I'm I'm not getting the vibe this person's going to be compliant, but I'm sure going to try because I think it's that important. And then they're like, hey, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. I'm like, oh, OK. All right. All right. I'll take credit. I really had no idea how this was going to go. You're not going to know that, but <laughs> I kind of yeah. rolled the dice. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know. Exactly. And that's like I always say, you know, I don't have the crystal ball. I can just tell you a lot of people have undiagnosed sleep apnea going out there. And there's so many different treatment options, whether it be the CPAP, an oral appliance, surgery, the implant, 
you know, sometimes I really like diagnosing sleep apnea people who are maybe a little bit overweight or obese because that is the trigger it takes. It's the motivation. It's the impetus for them to start making those changes. Man, if I just lose, you know, so if I lose 20 pounds, am I going to get off this machine? I'm like, maybe let's go for it and let's try. And, you know, one guy recently saw already lost 10 pounds and he wasn't too overweight, but now he doesn't snore anymore. And one of the best things about treating sleep apnea insurers, you know, is you get to treat their bed partner. And so it's almost like a two for one special. You're keeping them together. Happy wife, yeah. happy life, as they say. And yep. I would say it doesn't matter what gender you are. I 100 yep. percent agree that as long as your bed partner yep. is happy, yeah. you know, the, the home is just a happier place because everybody is getting good rest for sure. Have you had a number of patients who are now kind of seeking help? but they're on significant other number two and didn't do it for significant other number one, but oh, yeah. <laughs> that they're sort of remarried or, you know, re-cohabitating. Yep. They're like, this is really important. I'm like, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, <laughs> can't sleep. Yes, yeah. for sure. I've definitely seen that too. I, there's something to that 100%. Yeah, for sure. I do know that I read just in terms of one other medical thing that we might see an increase in periodic limb movements. So for anybody who doesn't know what those are, it's just like a periodic movement of the legs that happens at sleep. Generally speaking, we don't, it's sort of normal part of the aging process to get some more periodic limb movements. When I read that, I, I kind of resonated with the notion of aging and having more leg movements, but I can't say that I've seen an uptick in true what we call restless legs or this need to move that's really disruptive to sleep. What has your experience been with that? Has that been something you've seen more? I know. That's a good question. So let's break it down, right? Restless leg syndrome versus periodic limb movement disorder. So restless leg syndrome is the urge to move your legs, gets worse in the evening. There's got a circadian rhythm to it, happens at the end of the day, and can keep you from falling asleep at least three nights a week. Definitely, we know what happens most often in pregnant women. It's a really tricky condition because there's a lot of mimics, right? If you've got neuropathy, if you got arthritis, if you got sciatic, if you just don't move a lot and your legs bother you. And then the nighttime version is a periodic limb movement disorder where you can kick your legs. Sometimes it's associated with awakening and arousal at night, but sometimes it's not. Some of the research shows that has a higher prevalence in women, but I feel like I haven't seen that clinically. I feel like it's one of those things that I'm sure just like sleep apnea in women, it's underdiagnosed, but people don't necessarily recognize it as a problem. Meaning, you know, I've maybe kicked my legs my whole life, or I just sleep in a separate bed now, or my partner got used to it, or we just set up a bunch of pillows. Or sometimes it doesn't necessarily show up as a clinical disorder, meaning like it happens, but I'm used to it. I know you've probably heard people, yeah, my legs bother me, but I just rub them together. That makes me feel better. And I can fall asleep. So then you would say, well, then that's not really a syndrome if, you know, you can fall asleep. Okay. It's definitely really tricky to treat. I would think the reason it can potentially happen more in women, especially as we get older, is if we have menorrhagia, when we're having really, really heavy periods, if we have fibroids, because periodic limb movement disorder and restless leg syndrome is associated with decreased iron stores. And so actually one of the treatments is just to, you know, if your ferritin is low, ferritin is a blood storage for iron, just increasing that level. But it's not that simple. And yeah, I definitely have women and men who suffer from it. And we just give them more and more dopaminergic agents, or sometimes I even put them on some Parkinson type medications to see if that'll help. And sometimes a little bit of magnesium can help. But really, I feel like there's a whole spectrum to this. And I don't I don't have a good answer. <laughs> what are your thoughts, to Dr. Cole? I would say I think there's been a change in the philosophy just in general from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, just because there's been a lot more emphasis on the importance of iron. So I 100% agree with you. I do look for that. That has been something I've actually seen more commonly, which would make sense in the premenopausal women who tend to have heavier periods just because they're losing their blood every month. But I have definitely seen it in older ladies. I definitely look out for it, especially if someone's had a prior like gastric bypass type surgery. You know, I have seen a little bit more anemia in general, just true anemia, but also just iron storage deficits. I just wonder if there's some absorption issue or something associated with that. I do that. And I recommend a lot of things like stretching because I know they've been looking at yoga therapy. And I'm, I'm telling people, I'm like, this is not like power yoga right before bed. This is more like gentle stretching and sort of release, especially since that could be helpful. 
And more recently, Sleep 2023, there's been quite a bit of emphasis on actually maybe making the first line agents not the dopamine agonist therapies, but rather things like what you had mentioned, gabapentin, using those for treatment as sort of the primary treatment, just because one of the problems with restless legs treatments, all these medications, pharmacotherapy, right? We give you a prescription. As you mentioned, prescriptions have side effects. And the problem is that we get a lot of side effects with what we call augmentation or the symptoms kind of happening earlier in the day or more intensely. And they're sort of resistant to the medications that we give. And then you have to try to switch them and try different things. And, you know, especially if someone's had restless legs for a long time because there is some degree of genetic predisposition, it can really be a challenge to to manage them as we know. For sure. I just wanted to add one thing that I like to recommend as you're talking about that is actually warm baths, you know, magnesium salt bath, Epsom salt baths, you know, create sort of a ritual because that also can help relax your mind. You're sitting in your tub, maybe you're reading a nice book or listening to some soft music, and that can get you into more of a calming state. And the magnesium is absorbed really best through the skin and it can help maybe calm down some of the legs. So that's such great advice. CBD oil has been looked at as well. I can tell you that it really has some nice analgesic effects. My mother-in-law, before she had her knee replacement surgery, was doing a lot of CBD oil on her knee because it would just throb by the end of the day. And it wasn't a panacea, but it certainly helped. And it, you know, she was, she wasn't getting absorbed through the skin and, you know, she wasn't stoned Mima. She was just regular Mima. (laughs) But so what she was getting actually had CBD. But yeah, she found it really, really helpful. And I do have some patients that swear by that a sort of like massage oil kind of a thing, you know, in addition, the the massaging of the legs. I have those leg squeezers. Have you seen those? You know, the compression ones. I know a lot of runners use them. Like the Korean spa leg squeezers. (laughs) I used to go to a Korean spa that gave you the leg squeezers. And that was phenomenal, though. I have not had anybody actually go and purchase Mm. one of them. I feel like that would be a very big investment for someone. I that can't be cheap, especially if they're using them at a spa, I feel like. Yeah. But there is an FDA approved treatment for RLS that involves some kind of squeezing. So Oh, you know what? I you know, I think I remember seeing something about that. A long time ago we've heard of that. Yeah. I feel like no one talks about it, but you know, just I, I tell patients who we've tried everything, even the Epsom salt bath. I'm like, well, if you want to invest in some mechanical compression stockings and they're like, oh, like the ones in the hospital. I'm like, well, you know, if it works, <laughs> if you can sleep better, good. But yeah, they are pretty costly. I think, you know, $500,000, depending if you get wow. you know, the ones that go all the way up to your, your hips. I did want to touch base with our final moments together about some holistic treatments, herbs. I found a really fascinating research article that came out in 2016 called Botanicals and Their Bioactive Phytochemicals for Women's Health. But it's literally like, I mean, it's 20 something pages long. I actually did not want to kill a tree, so I did not print it all out. And it talks about a number of herbs. Uh, You had mentioned melatonin, And I had seen the same data that you had that if you give two milligrams, some people really in a randomized trial found that there was some benefit for menopausal women. This was back in 2015. That study was published that I looked at. But I just wanted to know if you had any comments on Pedram Navab when I did an episode with him mentioned chaste berry, that he's been through the Andrew Weil Integrative Medicine Program as well. And there was an OBGYN who did integrative medicine who swore by chaste berry for their patients for sleep. Any thoughts on that particular herb, I guess? Yeah, I've definitely heard of chaste berry. I like to recommend phytoestrogens. So phytoestrogens are plant-based estrogens. So things like soy products, tofu, red clover is one of them. I don't know if chaseberry fits among that category. Black cohosh, I feel like just has really good PR. I feel like most people know about that one. The studies are actually a little bit mixed for black cohosh, but definitely things that have um, plant-based phytoestrogens can be beneficial. There is the estroven which is plant-based phytoestrogen, and there's one for nighttime. So it does have the plant-based phytoestrogen plus a little bit of melatonin. Just anecdotally, some patients have found that super helpful. I generally recommend the things that are helpful to help promote 
relaxation can also promote improvement in menopausal symptoms. So, you know, traditionally I like to recommend like oral lavender, passion flower hops. Those things can be beneficial as well. And magnesium, you know, I feel like magnesium is so under-recognized and I wish there was a better way for us to really test if someone's deficient. I don't know if you just, I just feel like I hear a lot of people saying people are magnesium deficient, but I think there's just a lot of good things about magnesium to help relax the body, relax the mind. It does work on GABA, which can help promote sleep. And then going back to our food choices, right? The first episode of the season, right? You listen to that episode if you didn't hear about it yet. You know, tart cherries we talked about, maybe even almonds. Our bodies are so complex and supplements can be helpful, but I think it comes down to our lifestyle. And what you feed your brain is just as much as what you feed your body. So the things that you're consuming on social media, right? The people that you're following, what advice are they giving you? The five people that you hang out with. If you're hanging out with five other women who are going through menopause or perimenopause and they're just, you know, having a really, really hard time, guess what? You're going to have a really, really hard time too. So look out for people who are doing well. And I think it just goes back to when I ask patients for new consults, do they know anybody who's on a CPAP and have they had benefit? Because they have that bias. Well, my friend's on it and she absolutely hates it. She has high blood pressure, so her doctor makes it. And I don't know about this, but, and then you have the other person that's like, oh yeah, you know, my mom has it and she loves it. Like it changed her life and I can't wait for that. I'm a big fan of taking a look at someone's mindset and really partner with them where they're at. Supplements can help, but really they're not the panacea. Exercise, right? <laughs> Control your stress. Listen to a good podcast and get legitimate data. <laughs> Don't follow health influencers who are sponsored by um, supplement companies. There are good supplements that can help, but just be careful how you consume your health information. So a little bit of a side there, but yeah. No, but that's the perfect summary to end the season because it represents what we're really mm. trying to say. Like, here, we have some data that melatonin may be helpful. Black cohosh, great marketing, maybe, and eh, mixed results. At the end of the day, let's get back to the basics. Cognitive behavioral therapy. You actually have a mental bookmark, because I have to say this, Ben, if you're listening to this episode, I have a friend, Ben. He actually, when we were talking about almonds, he actually had a 100-calorie snack pack, and he counted exactly the number of almonds in that pack, and apparently it's 17. So I quoted, I'm like, well, maybe it has like 10 almonds. That's like a you know 100-calorie snack pack. So thank you for the fact check, Ben. I love you. Thank you so much for that. He's hysterical. <laughs> That's awesome. Bottom line is that there are some supplements that can help with hot flashes that may actually be beneficial. You mentioned a number of them, also our diets. I did try, and I do have them sitting here. I just bought them from Costco. I ate some yesterday that were delicious. I did sleep well, but to be truthful, I also had like a glass of wine. So I don't know. I kind of mixed things up last night, but I'm going to try it tonight. I'm going to try some kiwis. The study was done with zest-free kiwis, and I found them at Costco. So I'm going to try a couple tonight, an hour before bed, and we're going to see how it goes. I am taking my advice literally. And it was beautiful. And I have to say that the hairy parts are a little much on those um, zespries. I just kind of ate the inside and not the skin because the skin's a little tougher, but I'm used to a different brand of kiwi. There's other brands of kiwis that are a little bit smaller and the outside's a little bit softer. So food for thought, guys. But yes, thank you so much. This was such a cool, wonderful episode. I am always appreciative of my friends coming on board. Just so you guys are aware, we're going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus. I am going to enjoy the summer with my kids. I'm going to be doing some different things. I'm going to be coming up with a whole slew of new topics. So I plan to be back for the school year in the fall, doing some more episodes. If you'd like to have a consult with me, you can go to oak.care slash sleep. The next time I see you, we'll also have a fully functioning website called asktheSleepMD.com. You can check out my TikTok and Facebook and my YouTube video should be up by then. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening. I'm currently seeing patients in California, New Jersey, and in Georgia. Dr. Val, where do you see patients? I know that you do have sort of a clinical practice in addition to sleep phoria. Can anybody reach you if they want consultation? For people who live in Hawaii or California, I'm restricted to those two states. And that's through Sleep Life Med. Awesome. And we're both telemedicine docs too. So 
Dr. Val, always a pleasure to have you. You're the freaking best. Oh, you're so kind. I'm so excited to end this season with you. Super, super cool stuff. And who knows what we'll figure out, what we're going to talk about next. I love having you. You're the best. I really hate to have to do this, but these are my terms and disclaimer. This podcast is intended for persons 18 years or older. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The words and other content provided in this podcast and in any linked videos and materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice. If the listener or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately licensed physician or other healthcare worker. The views expressed on this podcast and YouTube channel have no relation to those of any academic hospital practice or other institution with which the authors are affiliated. There is a detailed terms of use agreement. You can see it all on the YouTube channel. In the interest of brevity and the fact that it's legalese and really hard to read, I am not going to read it. But accessing, reading, or otherwise using the podcast or YouTube channel does not create a physician-patient relationship between you and me. Providing personal or medical information to me does not create a physician-patient relationship between you or me or any other contributors to this podcast. Nothing contained in the site is intended to establish a physician-patient relationship to replace the services of a trained physician or healthcare professional, or otherwise to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You hereby agree that you shall not make any medical or health-related decision based in whole or in part on anything contained in the site. You should not rely on any of the information contained in the site and related materials in making medical or health-related or other decisions. You should consult a licensed physician or appropriately credentialed healthcare worker in your community in all matters relating to your health. You agree to indemnify and hold the author harmless from any claim or demand, including attorney's fees, made by any third party as a result of any content posted or made available to you by the site, any violation of law that occurs by you through the site, or anything you do using the site or the content contained therein. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast.